culturally, most of us are not, uh, we do not have the financial education or the financial literacy so that we are learning how not only to live for today, but preparing for the future. And so we do fall into this, this challenge where we are feeding the lifestyle based upon the expectations rather than sitting down and honing in and saying, okay, what do I need right now? What can sustain me right now? How can I save for the future? How good are you at budgeting and financing for your acting career? Well, today we have Willa Williams and Wesleya Echoes from Trinity Financial Coaching, and they have some great tips to help us as actors to do what we do without any stress or any craziness. I'm Lydia Nicole. This is Acting Smarter Now. Actors are notorious for not having uh, their finances in order. And as I was thinking about all of our challenges as actors and creatives in the money area, the first thing that came to me was when I was starting out in the business, I had a day job and I was booking a lot of acting jobs. And I was spending with the, um, with the intention that a lot of money was going to keep pouring in. And it did not. And I heard you talk about financial identity crisis. And as I was listening to that, I kept thinking, oh, my God, that's what I was going through. <laughs> First of all, what is financial identity crisis and how can we recognize it and then what can we do to stop it? <laughs> <laughs> we coined the phrase of financial identity crisis is basically exactly what you experience. For a lot of people, they come into money or they come into a sum of money or they're making a, a, a certain living. Okay, say it's, I don't know, $100,000, right? Well, sometimes in this day and age, when you're making $100,000, you're still kind of living paycheck to paycheck, depending upon where you live, depending upon what your expenses are. And what you thought you could do, earning $100,000 a year, you're saying that you can't do that. And now you have a financial identity crisis. Or like what you just experienced, I'm earning money, expecting to earn more. So I'm living like I'm already making the more with that expectation. But when the more doesn't come, then what happens? And so again, you're stuck. You're in identity crisis. And what can happen when you have this is you start to doubt. You There's confusion. Uh, you can start to walk away from your passion and your calling because you're basing the decisions based upon what's going on with your finances, as opposed to stopping and taking back and looking at the total, the total picture. And so when we get in that financial identity crisis, it's just, it's just a weird space because it's, it's like, again, it's confusion, it's self-doubt, unbelief. All these things come up when, when, when we are um, walking in that. Willa, one of the things you two discussed is that in identity crisis, you uh, can have the imposter syndrome. Can you talk about what that is financially? I mean, we know what it is creatively, but I, I never heard having imposter syndrome financially. It's pretty much the same because when you have earned this money, you, you are expected to live a lifestyle, a certain lifestyle, because you earn six figures. But when you find that you are not doing that, you begin to doubt yourself. You begin to doubt your ability. You begin to question, should I even be earning this? And one of the things that you asked about was how do we get rid of it? Get get rid of a financial identity crisis. One thing is to really begin to look at what values you have, what is important to you, and not try to live your life according to what society says. If you have the earnings and your lifestyle is where you enjoy, it doesn't matter that you don't have all the trimmings that society say you ought to because you are a six-figure earner. You don't have to have that. So imposter syndrome comes in there because it makes you feel like you shouldn't be there. You don't you feel qualify like 
or yeah, you, you just ought not do that. But that's you judging yourself based on what others think and say. And that's why the financial identity crisis uh, is important and uh, imposter syndrome is actually a symptom of financial identity crisis. Okay, so another part of that, you have imposter syndrome or you have keeping up with the Joneses syndrome where as an actor, um, you know, people think that because we're on television or we're in a movie that we are making a lot of money. That might have been true back in the 70s and 80s, but today you can be on TV a regular on a series and still have to have another job because they're not paying the same amount of money. Yet actors get into this bad, I don't want to say habit, but they get stuck in this thing of, you know, I, I'm, I don't want anybody to know that I'm not making money. So I have to keep up appearances. And now I'm in debt thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars buying a car. I cannot afford uh, either renting a, a condo or a house that I really can't afford. And now I am stretched beyond my means. And maybe I bought the house and now they're going to foreclose it. I've had friends who had their house foreclosed on. They, they've they had their cars repossessed as um, actors of color because I don't see this so much with white actors and I'm not trying to be, you know, get into race stuff, but culturally we're brought up differently. I, I can speak for myself. I was brought up in a, in a welfare home. So we lacked a lot. So mm -hmm. when money started coming in, I didn't know, Hey, put money away. Hey, think about your future. Hey, some, you know, there might be something that I was like, I was working at a job. I had two union um, uh, uh, health care. I was I was taken care of. I actually had three uh, insurance plans and I was covered on all of them. And so I thought, hey, life is good. Today, that's not the case. I don't care where you work. You're not covered with three, uh, you know, three health insurance uh, uh, coverage. But there is that thing of, you you were not raised financially literate. So if you could talk about that. Wow. So you you shared a lot and, and, and there's a lot yeah. of truth in what you shared. <laughs> that the fact that culturally most of us are not, uh, we do not have the financial education or the financial literacy so that we are learning how not only to live for today, but preparing for the future. And so we do fall into this, this challenge where we are feeding the lifestyle based upon the expectations rather than sitting down and honing in and saying, okay, what do I need right now? What can sustain me right now? How can I save for the future? Because see with the creatives, there is, you have to be able to know what to do in feast and famine. So you, when it, when it's a time of feast, you have to be willing and able to compare. And so there's a lot of things that we can allow to um, allow us to have discontentment with what's going on in other areas of our lives where we'll try to cover it up with with things or, or, or with how we project of how we can spend money. And that's not the case. Stay in your lane, do what you can do. And as a creative, you will have seasons of frugality, meaning you're gonna have seasons where you're gonna have to live slim, not because you have to because of lack, but because you know that's what you must do until the next project comes or until you get paid from the next project. So that's the balance I think actors, especially when you're just starting out, actors and creatives and all that have to have, they have to have that balance. They have to balance seasons of frugality so that they can weather um, the feast and enjoy it, but also be covered in times of famine when you don't have projects coming in and scripts aren't flowing in and agents aren't, you know, whoever aren't knocking at your door. Willa, I, I want you to add whatever you have to say and add okay. to it also um, how to in infuse faith and mindset into this change. That's very easy because it was pretty much what I was going to say. Because the one thing that you have to do when you talk about seasons of frugality, we speak of those as you know, times when we make personal decisions 
to spend our money in certain ways. We, our own selves, make a decision on what we want to do and how we want to do it. And with respect to the creatives, they have to do that because, as Wesley says, you're between projects. So you have to live in that gap between the time that I'm working now and I got to wait for that next gig to come on. And you have to be okay to tell those around you who are asking you, come on, let's go do that. Da, da, da. Come on, you can join me. We're going over to, you know, you have to be all right with that. You have to make sure that you're feeling like, okay, I do have the money because they may have it, but I can't use it for what you're saying you want me to do with it because I have another goal for that. And that goal is to make sure that I can sustain myself and continue to grow while I'm waiting for my next gig, gig to come on. Now, us personally, most of the time we can't do that. It's hard for us to say no. So that's where our faith comes in, where we really need God to tell us, to help us, to give us the strength for us to understand that he has promised to sustain us. He has provided us with everything that we need. And if he has given a call on your life to be a creative, he is going to make sure that you have everything you need during the gigs and between the times. So you just have to learn how to see that. And once you see that, it's not important what other people think because you know that the father is sustaining and maintaining you and your mindset is clearly focused on him and on your faith in him and the provisions he provides and will continue to provide through him. So faith is critical in making sure that you understand and you see that you can say no. It's okay to say no, because whatever you need, God is going to make sure that you have that. So how do I lower the volume on my shame and raise the volume on my faith? Because it's one thing to tell me, hold on to what God's word says, but yet I've got shame that is raging in my mind and telling me, see, you you know, all these, uh, you talked about confusion, you talked about imposter syndrome, you talked about doubt, and that shame amplifies it all that I can't hear the voice of wisdom. I can't hear the voice of 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 common sense. And I definitely cannot hear God's voice because I've got all these other voices that are screaming so loudly at me saying, well, if you don't go with your friend, if you don't go to this event, if you don't buy that new outfit, if you don't do this, then you are a loser because if you're an actor or if you're a creative, you should be styling, you should be going out there, uh, presenting a, a, um, rich, uh, um, a, a rich facade. Wow. So I think in that instance, that's where you would take a step back so that you could reclaim your financial identity. And how we help our clients do that is we help them walk in their steward identity. And so as a creative, all that we have, God has given us the ability to create, right? And we know this. And so that, and that is exactly what you're doing. But you have to be able to surrender. And so when you're able to surrender, you're able to surrender the shame, the guilt, the self-doubt. We're going to sit and you're going to surrender all of that to him. You're also going to surrender um, those, I don't want to say triggers, but you're going to you're gonna surrender the things that activate you to want to do something that you aren't capable or have the capacity to do, especially with your money. So you know what those things are. You talked earlier about your money story. So there are things that, that are in your money story. There are things that happened when you was a child, when, if, especially if you grew up with lack. There are things that will activate you to want to do certain things. You want to surrender that. So you want to surrender. You want to trust God. But you also want to be able to trust yourself and the decisions that you're making. And you want to trust the process. Your financial journey, your acting journey, your creative journey is a process. So do you trust God? Do you trust yourself? And do you trust the process? And then you want to earnestly seek God every step of the way. Every step of the way. You want to walk in wisdom and you want to walk in obedience. So if you're earnestly seeking him, then you want to walk in 
obedience and you want to walk in his wisdom that he's given to you. So now, granted, now this is assuming that that you are a person of faith and that are willing to apply these principles that 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 we're sharing. Right. Um, and then you have to be accountable because if you're praying, if you're surrendering and you're praying and you're trusting, then there's a level of accountability that you have to your prayer. And so some of the decisions that you are going to make, like will it said in these instances where you're going to be like, someone's going to say, well, do this, do that. Or you say, you need to look this kind of way. All right. But how do you, how are you being held accountability to your prayer? And if you have to look a certain way, do you not believe that God is going to show you a way to do it? That's not going to break your pocket because that's how he provides provision right? Do you have to buy the $3,000 dress or is there another way you can get the same dress for considerably less amount of money? There are ways that we can accomplish the same thing with less money, right? And then Mm -hmm. the R, your roles and your responsibility. What are your roles and what are your responsibility? Your role and responsibility as a steward is to manage and multiply. So how are you managing and multiplying the the, the gifts and the talents and the skill sets that God is giving you that is allowing you to even bring in more, allow you to increase? And then the last thing is just be diligent and develop a plan. You have to have a plan. So even as you're starting, or even if you're already in your acting career, what is your plan? What plan do you have in place to manage your finances? What plan do you have in place to manage everything that encapsulates what it is that you are doing so that you can stay on top of it, have a plan, and be able to plan for your future? So that's your steward identity. And I just basically walk through an acronym of steward. When you do all of that and you do that consistency consistently, and that developing part is how you just do it consistently, how you consistently surrender, trust, earnestly seek God, walk in his wisdom and obedience, be accountable, know your roles and responsibilities, and then continue to be diligent. That is walking in your steward identity. And that's how you can step away from the shame, the doubt, the confusion, and actually be on the unique path that God has put you on. And we call it the unique path of financial fulfillment because it's not enough to just earn a whole lot of money. You want to be fulfilled at the same time because there are people who have a whole lot of money and they're miserable, right? So you want to earn, you want to be fulfilled. You want to know that you are utilizing your gifts and skill sets that, that honors God, the reason why he gave them to you in the first place. So it reminds me of the parable of the talents. Uh, Willa, can you talk about the parable of the talents? And because that that's talking about stewardship in a different kind of way. Yeah. When we think about the parable of the talents, we know that when the owner was going away, he gave, when Jesus was going away, he gave 10 talents to one person, five to another, and one talent to the other. Well, we know that these talents were distributed according to the capacity of each of those three persons. So the first one who received 10 talents, he invested those talents, put it away and earned 10 talents. So he doubled what he had capitalized. The second one with the five talents did the same thing. Put away five, earned five, was able to present 10 to the owner when he came back. Well, the last one who was given only one talent, he took that talent and he, quote, hid it, put it aside so it could be protected. But it was protected in such a way that it wasn't earning anything. So when the owner came back, he came back and he said, show me what you have. Well, he received 10 talents plus 10 talents. From the first person. So that was 20. Job well done. You did a great job. Five talents plus five talents for the second person. Great. You doubled. Great job. The last one who only received one talent. And remember, they were all given talents based on their capacity. It was known that his capacity would only be able to just take one because he did not do anything. He set it aside and he came back and he said, Father, I know that you are strict on 
managing money, managing resources. I know how you do it. So I protected this. I made sure that no one would at all take this. It would be here when you got back. But he didn't earn anything. We receive resources from God to manage and multiply, not just to manage. It's to manage and multiply. And so that one talent was taken away and given to the one who had earned 10. Some people think that was wrong. They think that, well, he only had one. Why are you going to give it to the one who has so many more? Well, it's because that one who had one didn't do anything to multiply that talent. If he really knew the mindset of the one who gave him that talent, he would have known exactly how to multiply that talent, and he did it. And so we have to make sure that the resources that we are provided are used in such a way to continue to build and grow. They're not for us to sit back and they are for us to enjoy, but not to throw away. Sometimes some of the things that we do is not in enjoyment. It's really in throwing it away because we need to make sure that we multiply them so that they can sustain us now and sustain us into the future. Always enjoying a part of it, but setting aside some that we would be able to have something for the future. In the event that we are called on by ourselves, by our families, by whomever, by the Father, whomever, so that we can be prepared to help. And helping ourselves is the first thing that we need to do when we're dealing with that. There's so much about the the steward who took the one and hid it. Because I think a lot of artists are like the one. We want what the 10 got. We want that uh, you know, we want that increase. We want that bigness. I, as you were talking, I was thinking of the scripture to one is given 30 fold, 60 fold and a hundred fold. We all want that hundred fold, but yet we are not being good stewards over the little that we're getting. We see the little as a uh, humiliation and embarrassment. Again, going back to shame. I only got this. I'm so shame. You know, it's it's kind of like actors getting a couple of lines instead of getting the lead role when you haven't established yourself as an actor who could handle a lead role. It's like, uh, I need to trust you with a couple of lines first. I need to trust you with a couple of dollars first. So, um, cause as you were talking about, uh, the, the talents and the guy, I, I was thinking mindset this guy's mindset, first of all, was thinking. He was thinking, thinking because he was misinformed about the owner. He didn't really know him, but he had the wrong view of him. He saw him as a as an unjust boss. You know that it, that if something happened to the money, it would be over. He didn't. He didn't look at him and go, "Wow, you gave me an opportunity. You gave me. You gave me a piece." His heart was not in the right place. His mind was not in the right place. This guy was not in the right place. And I kept thinking of artists, actors who are are so talented, but they are not in the right place. When uh, Wes, you you talked about surrendering. Most artists don't even know what that means because we will not take direction from the director, let alone from God. We want what we want when we want it. And, and God is the order taker, not, not our God, but the order taker. So I am thinking about finances because over the years I've had to learn by fire. Um, and I learned through certain actors, one in particular, Shirley Ralph. I worked with her early on in my career. And Shirley has always made a living at her acting. Well, I've always had to have another job in order to do my acting. And so what I learned from Shirley was she wasn't buying stuff uh, at regular prices. She would take me to 
um, uh, uh, what was it? A big lot, or we would go to 99 cent store. We would go to this place or that place. <laughs> and then I had another, my other friend, Louisa would take me to rummage sales or garage sales. And I, and being a welfare kid, let me just tell you that I was appalled. Okay. I, I could not believe I was like, I'm not wearing you girl. Let me just tell you, I've been wearing second hand clothes all my life. I want new clothes. I want a new outfit, but it started to show me that if I just follow the directions and not my shame and go, you know what? There are a lot of, you could go to secondhand clothes where they have wonderful items that people maybe wore Absolutely. two or three times. That is not the hand-me-downs you had when you were growing up, but, but a lot of, a lot of stores have quality clothing that has been donated. So my friend Louisa taught me how to go shopping at secondhand clothing stores and really find great sales. There used to be a, a big sale that would come up on Mother's Day. And so we would take a pillowcase and you would go, they, they, they would open the doors at nine o'clock. We'd get there at six in the morning so we could go in there and charge and just grab stuff, put it in the pillowcase. It didn't matter if it was too big because we could take it to the cleaners and get it altered. <laughs> Right. But I started to learn to let go of that belief system or that shame or that trauma from my childhood and go, I'm going 99 cent store. And can I tell you, our 99 cent store closed recently and you would have thought I lost my mother. <laughs> I cried like a baby. I was like, what am I going to do? My store is closed. This is where I went for everything. And, and I will add to this, that I would run into successful people going into the 99 cent store and they always had an excuse. Oh, I, I, you know, I'm just getting this one out. And I said, man, let me tell you, I love me the 99 cent store. I will rejoice in the Lord yes. and be glad that I got me a 99 cent store. And I knew all the 99 store, cent stores in my area. And it really uh, not only blessed me, but... Mm -hmm but the transformation because I let go of my, my pride. Yes. I let go of my, uh, uh, feeling, um, less than, mm -hmm. you know, cause when, when you're told that you are a welfare case and this started it when I was a little kid and my mother would have to go to the welfare mm -hmm. office and they would shame her because she was on welfare. Mm -hmm. And then I went away on a, on, a a camping, not a camping thing. Um, it was called Fresh Air Fun. And they would send uh, at risk, uh, not at risk kids, but inner city kids to communities where there was wealth. Mm -hmm. And my first time going, the, uh, the there was a little girl in the house and she was about my age. And when I got off the train, she started yelling, we got our welfare baby. And so I, yeah, so I spent the summer <laughs> with these people that viewed me as a welfare baby and they wouldn't let me touch anything. And, and I know that that was very traumatic. So part of that for me uh, kept following me as I got older. Mm -hmm. So I would not, I remember a girl um, getting a handy, hand-me-down coat and walk, and it was cold. It was like maybe 30 degrees and I had this coat on and th this girl came and she said, that's my coat. And I took it off and I gave it to her because I was so ashamed of, of, of having been exposed like that. You know, mm -hmm. she was with her friends and she, and, and th that was traumatic. And the reason why I say this is because I don't think that I'm alone. I don't think that I'm the only one that is in the arts that comes from that background. Um, and, and we haven't, going back to, we haven't been taught Mm -hmm. that just because you're wearing something that was used already, it was gently worn, uh, <laughs> something that, you know, it, it it's not a big deal. Rich people do it all the time. You find more people all at the time. more rich people at consignment shops. Right. Absolutely. It, it's the poor people that are trying to buy new rich people don't care. Yes. That's why they That's got right. the money. So if you could just 
speak to that because that's a hard issue. That is that, you know, um, and there are a lot of people that go to church, a lot of artists that go to church or say, oh, I'm, you know, I'm spiritual. I do this, but they don't have a connection with God. They don't know God. They know their father's or mother's religion, but they don't have a relationship with him. They, so when you talk about trusting God, how can they trust someone they don't know? Well, that's a part of the steward identity that Wes spoke about earlier. The E letter in the acronym, excuse me, is earnestly seeking God. You have to seek to have a stronger relationship with him. And you're right, not your parents' relationship. You're not here. I'm going to pray to God through my mom and my dad. No, it's you personally. You have to have a strong relationship with him. And through prayer is the way that you begin to do that and reading the word and meditating and understanding so that you can hear him as he speaks to you. Your experience is not unlike ours. <laughs> it was not hand-me-downs, you know, living in the projects, the whole nine yards. But we have to get beyond that. And the reason I say that for me is, because, well, first of all, who told me that it was wrong to go to the resale store and purchase things? Because my experience, I love resale store. My experience with the resale store right now is that a lot of the things, I would say about 40% are brand new with tags on them. They're new. Some of these stores, like larger department stores, they will take their inventories and give them to the resale stores I, I, for tax purposes or whatever purposes it is that they do, they do that and that makes it available for me. I have gone into the resale store and I have picked up brand new, spanking brand new items that I would have gone into a, a luxury store and pay a couple hundred bucks. And at the resale store, I might pay six ninety nine for it. It's amazing. So I had to clear my mind to say, it's okay to go to the resale store, it's okay. And I think another thing that happened in my experience is growing up and saying, I'm not going to keep from my children, my family, what my parents made me wait for. Once I get the money, I'm gonna spend, spend, spend. I'm gonna get you this and well, Trying to do that at the regular department store and just at any store that's not discounted is not prudent, is not reasonable, and it is not going to help you sustain your finances. It just doesn't. So I had to make sure that I understood that it's okay to teach children, to teach others responsibility, and that responsibility came from showing them the value of helping them understand the value of the choices that they make and to make sure that they and I continue to make decisions based on what we really care about, not what somebody else has told us, not what somebody else has created as this is the goal that you should achieve. No, the goal that I should achieve is the one that I have established for myself through my relationship with God. That's the goal that I should achieve. And anything other than that, I should let it go. So it's it's a whole mindset change that we have to have in order to be able to go into that dollar store, that resale store, that consignment store, or where hand-me-downs given to us. Second, it, We have to know that it's okay. And we have to know that it's okay for us. And if somebody else sees us and I don't, there was a day that I would have taken that coat off and given it to that girl. But right now I wouldn't be cold outside. I would say, oh, thank you. You did a good job. Thanks for keeping it for me and walked on out and was warm. You know, you just have to, you have to be okay with it for yourself. Goals. Okay. You just, yes. you just opened up a whole uh, can of worms <laughs> here <laughs> about financial goals. First of all, how to have your goals align with God's word. Cause I could have goals, but if they don't align with God's word, those goals don't mean anything. They're fleeting. So as you say goals, I'm thinking two things. First of all, 
what is what is my mission and my destiny? Why did God create me? I I I need to know that first. Then once I know that, then I can start looking at how you know what are my goals. How do they align with God's purpose for my life? And mm-hmm. and if they don't, to put them aside, because uh, there's two scriptures that I think of, um, you know, uh, c- commit to the Lord and he will establish them, right? Commit your goals yeah, to commit the Lord. Yeah, commit your works to the Lord. But co- mm-hmm. Commit mm-hmm. it to the Lord and he will establish it. I also am thinking of uh, if I delight myself in the Lord, he That's gives it. me the desires of my heart. So that if, and it, and, and I used to see it differently, but the more I got closer to God, the more I, I got that, wait a minute, God's not going to give me whatever I want. He wants me to get closer to him so that I get to know him so that the desires of my heart match up with his desires, not my desires. Mm Because I think sometimes we read the Bible erroneously. Or we we go to churches and we take what the pastor says instead of what the Bible tells us, study to prove yourself <laughs> approved unto God, that it is your it is your responsibility to study the word, no matter what anybody tells you, you got to go and explore and and discover the word for yourself. Otherwise, you are out of order. You know, um yeah. I didn't grow up in a I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I I, I I I share this all the time, but my mother was a prostitute. My father was a pimp. My house was not a godly house. Yet my mother, uh, it was the law in in our culture that you had to go to Catholic school. I do not know why, but I had to go to Catholic school. So here we were in Catholic school. And when I was in second grade, we had the Pope coming to visit us. The the Pope was doing a New York tour. And for for some reason, our school was picked. So I told my teacher, you know, the Pope is like a pimp because the Pope, you know, (laughs) women give them their money and they kiss the ring. It's like a pimp. So I was not allowed to go the day the Pope was coming because they didn't want me to embarrass anybody. But that's what I grew up with. I had dark and light. And so my understanding was uh, odd. (laughs) But, (laughs) But within that, I can tell you that I knew God from the age of three and a half years old, that even though uh, we did not, we were not a church home, God uh, spoke. I remember, I can tell you when God started speaking to me as a little kid, he would just speak to me. So I knew right from wrong early on. Uh, as far as certain things, not when it comes to money, but I knew other things uh, right from wrong. Money was a whole different conversation because God wasn't in that part of my life. You know, I, he was he was relegated. I, I say this to people. I go, you know what? Um, there was a time when I would let God in my living room and in the bathroom. And I would escort him from the living room to the bathroom, but he couldn't go in my bedroom. I didn't let him go in the kitchen. And he definitely was not allowed in my closet. <laughs> and and then I had to start coming to terms with, if he is my God, he should be allowed to be in every area of my life. Period. End of story. But for a long time, he wasn't because of misinformation that I got from the church. I got misinformation. Mm. And I was like, well, I don't know about that. You know, uh, one one was God was going to give me a short, fat, ugly man as my <laughs> husband. And I said, yeah, that's not going to work for me. So he's not allowed in that area. <laughs> And he wasn't allowed in my acting either because someone in my my church at the time said to me, you know, that's of the devil, right? And so I had had quite a time. I said, well, then God can't be in that conversation because I'm not giving up my acting. Again, the misinformation. As artists, we are told certain things, and, and everybody, but as artists, we're told certain things. 
what we're doing is of the devil and you know how could you do that but yet when you become famous then those same people that said it was of the devil and i saw it in my church i saw people in my church who would tell me it was of the devil and then they said can you get denzel washington to come to speak at our church i said wait a minute if it's of the devil why you want me to get denzel what, what's, what's up with that you can't have it both ways and so it yep. wasn't until i had a a a, a, a pastor or a minister a uh, tim story who spoke to me who 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 said to me God made you this way for yeah. this time so you could yes. fulfill the destiny that he gave you. Absolutely. And that's when I that's when I understood, oh, God gets to be in everything. These people are stupid. Yeah. They don't yeah. know what they're talking about. But my God loves artists. My God loves prostitutes. My God <laughs> loves, you know, because that was the other thing. It was like, well, your mother's a prostitute. I said, wait a minute. Jesus <laughs> loved um, um, Mary Magdalene. Don't give me that smack. He loved... <laughs> He loved her. So that's all I need to know. I love God because he loves the hookers. I don't, you don't need to tell me anymore. So, but with the misinformation, how do we come back, start seeking after God earnestly, going back to what you said, to seek him earnestly? What does that look like? Seeking God earnestly looks like you wanting to know who he is. First of all, you want to know who God is. You also want to understand um, who you are in Christ. So who is God and in all of his facets and all the facets of him? Who are you in Christ? What does it mean to be in the image of Christ? What does, what does all of that mean? What does that mean? And then you also want to understand like, how the Holy Spirit moves in order to guide you. And I think the, foundationally, those are three things. So as you are learning and as you're growing and as you are, are searching, first of all, yeah, who is God? Because oftentimes, you know, you know, you hear the people say, you know, God is like a father. Well, if you don't have, if you have an estranged relationship with your natural father, then it's going to be hard for you to see God as a father. So you got to understand who God is in totality because he's so many things, right? Um, as it relates to your, your question about, you know, aligning our faith with our finance, I think financial fulfillment and building wealth is something that has to happen from the inside out. Um, because the Bible speaks over 2,400 times about money. So clearly money is an important thing to God. Why? Because money is about the only thing that comes between us and God. Money becomes that idol. So when the Bible is saying you can't serve two masters, you're going to love one and you're going to hate the other. We're talking about, and we're not, and I'm not saying money because money is a neutral, money is amoral, but there is the thing called the spirit of mammon and the spirit of mammon can rest on money such that we then begin to put all of our faith, our security, our worship, our everything to either the money or the chasing of it. The only way that we can present, prevent ourselves and position ourselves to not fall into that trap because no one is immune to that. All of us, me, you, Willa, all of us could fall into that trap. The only way that we can do that is by honoring our steward identity. And that's that, again, that consistent surrendering, trusting, seeking. Because if not, then we will, all those other things will begin, begin to raise itself up which is why we have this shame because it's supposed to look like this, but I'm right here. No, you're okay where you are and you're okay to follow the path and, that God is leading you and at the pace that God is leading you. Because sometimes our journey is paced because we lack the character, the integrity, and the capacity to handle all that God has planned for us. So if you truly believe Jeremiah 29, 11, that says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for you to prosper, plans for you. So if, if you know that he has the plans for you and, and there are things that are predestined in your life, they're laid up, they're waiting for you, waiting for you, but it's not released because we are in alignment. 
And that alignment is a growth of character, it's integrity, it's morals, it's it's all of that for us that, to have the capacity to receive it. You know, we, we want, you know, you might want a private jet. If God gave you a private jet for you to get back and forth right now today, what would you do with it? Do you know a pilot? <laughs> <laughs> do you do do you do you have do you do you know how to fuel it? Do you have access to a tarmac? Uh, do you, how you you know? <laughs> I was just gonna say you can get the money for the for the jet, but then you don't have the money for the fuel, right? It's kind of like you buy this That's expensive right. car, and then you cannot buy the gas for it, right? Or take care of it. That's right. So the thing is, is that. We all have desires. We all have dreams. Are we willing to stay in alignment with God and allow him to release them to us as we are growing and maturing, not only spiritually, but mentally so that we can receive it? And And when we do it out of alignment, uh, I think that's when things get a little wonky. And and I would add to that, it's the waiting on God, not... Uh, passively, but actively, Absolutely. that you're waiting on God actively, doing your uh, uh, being diligent on what you need to do. Take your classes, uh, build up your income. Um, you know, take, take care classes. of your responsibilities. Mm-hmm. Do you know? Uh, do what you have to do because God works with us, but we have to do our part. I, I uh, again. Um, I know certain actors who are Christian, who they're waiting on the Lord, but they're not doing anything. They're just waiting. I I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know what? God God sent you to me so I could give you the steps to take. That's why he (laughs) sent you to me because he said, Lydia knows the steps. Not that I know everything, but if somebody comes to me, then I know that's my mission is to say, you're supposed to do this, 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 and this. And I've had actors tell me, well, I don't need to do that. Well, then you are not really serious about what it is that you want because you can't want to be an actor, a singer, a dancer, and not work at it. You, you need the craft. And a lot of times we have people who are gifted, not talented. They are gifted and they put the gift above the gifter and yes. and you see it in churches all the time mm-hmm. where you have the worship singers that have these glorious voices and they are out of control their their lives are out of control they they do not um they do not serve the god they sing about and so as creatives we always want to be clear that god is the big creator and we're the little yes. creators And we don't move unless he tells us to move that when he's put a gift in us. And this is what I had to learn because again, when we have misinformation, we do not know God put something in you. He's not going to give you something and then say, I'm not going to let you use it. I'm not going to make you this outrageous singer. And then you can never sing to anybody. I'm not going to give you the skill to be a carpenter, and then you can never build anything. If he's put a gift in you, it is because he's got a time and a place for you to show up with it. But in the Mm -hmm. meantime, Mm -hmm. practice that gift. Continue to sing. I think of Whitney Houston, who had a most amazing gift. She opened her mouth and 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 you felt the presence of God in the room, same as Aretha Franklin, same as um, uh, Barbara Streisand. You feel the anointing when they open their mouth, but just because they have the anointing doesn't mean that they are superior than everybody. We go back to the scripture where it says, think of yourself highly, but not more highly. So we are all supposed to think well of ourselves, but I'm no better than you and you are no better than me. <laughs> And so, and and without knowing that scripture, when I was a kid, I'd walk in that attitude. You know, if somebody said, wait a minute, you ain't better than me. No, you're not. I don't care. And, and, and that was already in me that, that scripture was already in me before Mm -hmm. I did. But, but to be able to sit and let people teach you 
things you do not know because we don't know everything. You know, artists excel at their creative ability. But when it comes to business and finances, probably 80% of the times you see the downfall of creatives because they don't understand money management. They have no idea of being a good steward over anything because some of them have been pampered. They've been uh, spoiled in one way while somebody's taking their money uh, the other way. You know, and I worked in the record business when I first um Early on in my career, I worked in the record business for 15 years, and I saw people taking such advantage of incredibly talented and gifted artists because they didn't know anything about their money. Not one thing. You say, did you open up your bank statement? I got a bank statement. <laughs> it's like, what? How do you not know you got a bank statement? I saw artists, well, one in particular, they amassed a lot of money. They were huge. Their business manager took everything and they were living in a Bel Air. And one day the sheriffs came knocking and told them they had a half an hour to get out because their home was sold. The business manager had everything in his name, sold the house, took their money. They ended up having to move into a three bedroom a uh, 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 home uh, apartment in in God knows where away from the city, and it was because they had no idea of business. So if you can talk about how we should start to learn about business, how should you know from bank account to um, looking at our bank statements? to what are we looking for when we look at our bank statements? What what do we need to start implementing in order to start to be better stewards? One thing I want to say is you need to know your industry. The first thing. Yeah. Yes, you are the artist, but you are an artist in a business. So you need to learn about that business. You need to learn, understand what an advance is. You need to know that advance is a loan against future income. So with you interest. cannot, you pay with interest, interest with right? That, so you, you can't <laughs> ball out on your advances. So all the things you need to ask the pertinent question. You need to read the contract yes, with a honest. lawyer. And so these are yes. the things that I mean, first and foremost, these are the fundamentals. If you are already employed and you know that you want to get into this industry, then I'm going to recommend that you save or start saving or you have money in in an, in an account that is earmarked specifically for developing this craft because you are going to need an attorney you're going to need if it's five hundred dollars a contract if it's however much a contract or or, or or whatever the retainer is you need somebody that can read those contracts so that you can know what it is you can expect to earn out of that from there, then again, that's your budget. So what is your budget? What is your bare bones living budget, right? I, the reason why I say bare bones is because if you're not working and you're only going to um, live off the money that you earn um, from your creative job, when we talked about that feast and famine, but then you need to know how much money is going to take, which is going to add into how much you're going to need to save in order to survive right? So if you know that you're, because you don't want to lose your house, your car, you need to be able to eat. And if you have medical, and especially if you're paying it out of your pocket, you want to be able to con continue that. So you want to make sure that you have enough money saved up so that you can continue to pay those things when you don't have a check. So when it, when it all comes in, make sure that you have at least three to six months of that saved up because I don't know how long it, the, the, the turnaround is before you get a next project. So that this is how you have to think about your money when you, when it comes in um, irregularly and when it comes in in chunks, this is kind of how you have to look at it. Also, if you are already working and if you have debt, then you want to probably live out of the money that you're working out of. And then the money that you get from your projects, you can earmark that for other things. For like I said, that future savings, earmark that to get out of debt. 
Because as soon as you get out of debt, that's more breathing room you have the next time you have a project or the next time you have a break between projects. So there's, I mean, it's, it, there's certain strategies that you can use. I think it's going to be based upon the individual person, but just in general, as I'm just thinking about different type of um, situations, those are some of the things I can think of top of hand. Get a handle of your debt. If you have a lot of debt, get a handle on that. Get a pay, get a, a, a determine what type of payoff strategy you're going to use to get out of your debt. The monies that you get coming in from projects, try to save that up so that you can buy the additional professional services that you need. Start saving up for your union, whatever union that might help offset some of these things. Cause you might have a union that offers medical, you have a union that offers, you know what I'm saying? So whatever it is, while you're getting the hours, start saving up for that. Again, you are aligning your money with your values and your beliefs and you believe and you value your opportunity to be able to share what God has put into you in the, in the area of the arts, whatever that is, singing, dancing, acting. So you have to make sure that you are continuing to position yourself to take advantage. I don't know. Where are the auditions? Do you need flight? In money? Do you need transportation money so you can get back and forth to auditions? So these are some of the things that you just kind of have to think about if you're going to pursue this. And I hear the stories of people who say, well, you know, I went out to LA and only had $700 and I didn't know how I was going to do it. I mean, if you want that to be your story, then, then you need to listen to that person to figure out exactly what they did. <laughs> but Again, the steward identity for you is for you to understand what your story is. So what can you do? So if you are actively working, how can you begin to save these monies? Yes, you're going to have seasons of frugality. So you might be living a minimal life, a minimalist lifestyle right now. Why? Because you believe in the dream. And because you believe in I the would. dream, you're willing to invest in the dream. And so that's why yes. you're not spending a lot of money on a lot of things because you know you have to invest in a dream. I got to pay my lawyer. I got to pay this person. I got to, I need to be able to get to auditions. I need to do these things. So I think that there are a couple other things too. A, a lot of creatives and those just people generally do not have bank accounts. You need to have a bank account so that you can really understand banking for yourself. Just like Wesley has said, you need to know and understand it for yourself. You need to be positioned so that if a contract comes to you, you have the ability to have an attorney to read it. Know what the terms are. Know that if you do get an advance, it's going to be interest attached to that money. Have your attorney rewrite it or, or do whatever it takes so that you agree exactly with the terms that you get. Make sure that you are bank. And a, a one thing you talked about shame earlier, humble yourself and eliminate the shame so that you can approach those persons who have the information, a professional, an attorney, a banker, to give you directions on how to get to where you need to be with respect to financial literacy, financial education, banking, no the jargon, know the terms, know that you need a checking account, you need a bank account, a savings account, know what a debit card is. I don't know how many people are using checkbooks now, but there's still some out there writing checks, but know and get your receipts so that you can track what you're spending and track what's going on. And the three to six months so that you can live comfortably between projects and gigs Make sure that you have that, but you got to have somewhere to put it. So a savings or checking account is critical. One that's in your name and not your name and the manager or just the manager, because then you can eliminate those situations like you described where the person, their whole, their property was sold under them because was it really in their name? We don't know, but make sure that you can walk into the bank and go to your bank account and manage your funds that you have put in there and you can use them in any way that you need or you feel necessary. You have to be able to do it for yourself. I want to add two things to the, the savings, the three to six months. Here's what actors need to know. Sometimes you are waiting a year, 18 months before you get a job. 
that three to six months is not going to is not going to be a runway for you. So while you may have six months of savings, you need to have at least a part time job that is still uh, bringing in some kind of cash that you're not depleting that six months right away. Because I I also I've been there. I you know I had that little nest egg. But it didn't come for a, mm -hmm. a, a much longer period. What happens mm -hmm. is you start to get desperate. Then you take jobs that compromise you. You, you know, you want to be working as an artist. So then you take a job that compromises you that you would not normally take. But you and you see it all the time. I mean, we see it all the time. People take jobs because they got to pay their mortgage. They got to pay uh, their team, you know, if they have assistants or they have a driver or whatever, and they're just taking the jobs because they got to earn money. But if you can start not only having a savings account, but have steady income coming in, maybe you have merchandise that you sell. Maybe you, you have lectures that you do that you have other things you can do to bring in the money so you're still storing money while you are spending. Because if you are living on this planet, you are going to be spending. No matter how frugal you are, you still got to spend money. So if you can just have a, a, a side hustle, something that won't make you a slave, but give you more freedom, <laughs> If you have yeah. to work on the weekends so that your weekdays are free to go to auditions or do what, whatever it is that you want to do, or maybe you work at night. So your days, you know, you figure out your time, but make a decision. I'm going to keep my side job. Uh, Marla Gibbs, who was in um, the Jeffersons, mm -hmm. her first three years, I believe either two or three years on that show, she kept her job at the airlines because she said this could go tomorrow and I won't ha and she was making good money but she did not let go of that job for for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. We want stuff and we want it yesterday. What yeah. what I've learned the hard way, I've learned this the hard way is that you you can't go okay I'm going to have going to have a nest egg and then I'm going to leave cuz let me tell you I left my job many times. I'd left you know, I had a job and then I said, okay, I've saved enough money. I'm out of here. I'm going to, and then I was back to looking for a job because my money ran out and, and the jobs that came in did not meet my financial needs. So I just want you artists, you actor to know that in the day and age that we live in, the, the paychecks are not as big as they used to be. So you have to take care of yourself financially. And if you have income coming in, you won't feel like you're drowning. You won't feel like, uh, you know, you won't hate God. Cause a lot of times we start yeah. hating God. Cause we go, you put us in, you put me in this situation. You know, um, it, it, he didn't tell you to do what you did. So mm. you have to take responsibility if God, if God tells you to go somewhere, then he is opening the doors for you to get yes. what you need. He does not give you vision without provision. But a lot of times we have our own vision and then we're <laughs> expecting him to give our uh, to to be our provider. Yes, right. he is Jehovah Jireh, but there's a but in yeah. the conversation, <laughs> people. Right. And so we have to be we we have to work wisely. We have to be um, you know, you talked about, you know, the person who who went to La who came to Los Angeles with seven hundred dollars and then everything happened. We don't know if God told them to go. If God right. said, I'm opening the, the door for you. I, right. I can speak for myself that when I came to California, I have five hundred dollars in my pocket and God opened the door for me to to get a job at a record company. And everything just started moving in my uh, it, in my favor, but he was protecting me. I wasn't yes. doing anything yeah. on my own. I was like, okay, I'm gonna go here. Okay. I'm gonna go there. And you can tell when God's got you and when, and when he doesn't, when he doesn't have you, you are crying out to the Lord. Yes. And when he's got you, even when it's tight, you're like, okay, no worries. Let's go do this. 
It's all right. It's going to work out. I don't know how, but it's going to work out. And there's a different spirit on you when God is on you than when you are uh, are taking the task to yourself. And so for those of you wanting to know what that difference is, plug into God and then you'll feel the difference. As artists, we feel everything. Well, there's a different feeling when you're walking with God than when you're walking by yourself feeling the oppression feeling yes. the the anger feeling you know the thing the thing i always remind myself it is if i'm walking in condemnation i've let god go because god does mm. not condemn us he yes, convicts us right. which is different conviction is just correction it's yes. just saying okay that's not where i want you to go that's not what i want you to do but but um when he is when you're feeling condemnation, the devil is on you somewhere. He seduced you to open a door so he could slam you down. And you have to know that. And, mm-hmm. and I think you talked about the finances, the spirit of mammon. Mm-hmm. The Bible tells us uh, uh, money answers all things. It also tells us uh, about money is that the love of money is the root of evil, not money, but not the money. love right. of mm-hmm. money. Right. So who That's are right. we loving? Am I loving God or am I loving the money? If, uh, if I'm loving money, I'm out of alignment. If I'm loving God, then the money can flow. But yeah, if I, right. if all I'm doing is go, I'm going back to, he said, if you, if you do it, I'm paraphrasing, but if you do it for the kingdom, yeah. then he'll take care of you. Seek you, you know, first what are you the doing? kingdom. That's it. And That's his righteousness. It. And he'll it. add all yeah, things to right. it. All to all you. Things. Yes. So it, yes. it, it, it is, I'm, I'm, I'm looking to you, God, how are you? Uh, uh, what do you want? What do you exactly. need? Send me, send me, what do you need? Yes. So I'm, I'm, I know I'm a vessel. <laughs> I'm not, I did not produce myself. God produced me through my mother, but I'm a vessel. Yes. And in that is where the contentment comes because sometimes you have to stop and ask yourself, what is it that I love? Do I love the fame of this thing or do I love what I'm doing? Is the acting is what's fulfilling and, and you're able to get parts and you're able to pick your parts parts that you know resonate with you um you know because you may mention of doing anything just so you can get the money and i don't think you want to be positioned that way you want to be positioned to be able to be picky about your parts Mm -hmm. and say what you know and trust that god is going to create that path for you to be able to do that and the provision for you to be able to do that so that you can again maintain your integrity maintain your character right so it, it, it is contentment when you are earnestly seeking God and he is first and foremost in your life, you have contentment and you were okay. And you were okay with your nine to five. You're not ashamed of your nine to five. You know that your nine to five is your capital number one investment into your destiny and the dreams that you have laid up for yourself. That is one of the provisions that God has provided. So don't look down on the part-time job, the side gig, the hustle, whatever. You know, you, you, listen, my daughter's a creative. My daughter sings. I said, love your industry, learn everything about your industry so that you can, and she works in the industry, but she's also a performer. And so she's able to work her nine to five and she's also able to go in and tour and sing with the artists that she sings with. So she's able to, she has the duality of both. And I, you can do the same thing until the door opens up for you to do it full time. But you should be able to do it without shame, without feeling like you're a fraud. You, yes, you can be a CPA and accountant and have an acting job, you know? Because I, I look at programs and I see people, especially like, because I'm a, I'm a SVU fan, so I love, and I'm like, these actors, where are they? Like they are phenomenal, but they're doing what they love. And I'm they They might not, their name might not be in my mouth every, you know, every time I speak or every time I turn on the TV, I'm seeing something about them in the, you know, tabloids or whatever, but they're doing what they love. And I'll turn on another show and I might see them bringing their best self to that show. You know what I'm saying? So it's, you have to sit and think about, 
I'm doing this because of what? Am I doing it to give God glory? Because if that's the case, then I'm going to do it with contentment and I'm going to do it as he opens the doors and I'm going to walk in it and do and continue to do the work so that I can serve him and be great for his glory. And artistry is faith in motion. We yeah. move in art because we are, we are being led by faith. When you get a canvas, when you're a, a painter, you get a blank canvas and the faith yeah. you have is that you can put something on it that would be a value. When you have a piece of clay as a sculptor uh, or uh, as a, a, a pottery maker or whatever, you have faith that it's going to be something uh, that you're going to create art. If you're a writer, you get the blank paper and you have faith. You, you put either a book or a script or a poem, you're putting something on that blank page that's going to be a value. Mm -hmm. That's faith. And as artists, we have to stay in alignment with our faith. God gave us these gifts, not for us, but for us to be able to bless someone that when you write something that it touches someone, that it, it transforms yeah. them, you know, just like being good stewards of finances that does transform people. You teach something or you teach uh, finances to transform people's lives. Yes. So I want to talk about, first of all, your business, wealth and wisdom together. You have yes. a podcast. So yes. I want to talk about how you girls got together <laughs> to make this happen. My gosh, oh. do we have time? <laughs> Oh, wow. Okay. So, Long so yes, Wealth and Wisdom Together is our podcast, but we do, we also have we own a company called Trinity Financial Coaching. And with Trinity Financial Coaching, we uh, provide a one on one and group coaching. And in our podcast, our podcast is our, our creative outlet, right? <laughs> to empower <laughs> our audience um, to be able to do just what we said, embrace their steward identity and walk the, their unique path to financial fulfillment. And then on the coaching side is where you work with us one-on-one -on -one or in a group in order to do that if you can't just self-coach yourself through the tips that we're sharing on our podcast. Mm -hmm. Will and I have been friends for a long time um long time what, over over 20, 20 years over 20 some 20 years. years um yeah. and we each have our own individual stories as it relates to finances but we knew that the common thread was really how we were able to see how God showed up and 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 allowed us to walk our unique path we came together mm -hmm. as church members because we were members of the same church and Willa actually, I was a financial advisor before I started doing this. So, um, and on my journey, I stopped doing um, what I was doing as a financial advisor to raise my children because I needed something that was more stable. So I started teaching financial literacy courses at our church in order to continue to do what I loved about being a, a financial advisor. Um, and Willa was a student in one of my classes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She was a student in one of my classes. <laughs> and so we continue to journey. We continue to serve. And so now we're serving on the same team. We're serving on the stewardship team at church. We're, we're, we are helping to teach financial literacy. So she's walking with me and, te and we're teaching together now because we're growing the team. Yeah. And so we got this idea. I had this idea and we were both talking. We're like, this needs to go beyond our church, we need to take this to the masses because our our church can't be the only church that's understanding how to actively walk as a as a steward. So we come together, we have a meeting, we're talking, and so she brings the workbook that I provided. <laughs> and oh, one of the assignments in the class, it was like, if you could do anything, money was not an object. If the, if there's anything that you could do in your life right now, what would you be doing? Money is no object. What would you do? And she literally was writing. She showed it to me because I didn't know at the time that she would be teaching. She would have a company where she would be teaching um, people financial literacy and, and counseling them and coaching them and how to build wealth, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, what? Yes. That's what you want to do? And yep. we were like, wow. So we're like, let's do it. <laughs> and that was, that was 2000. 
2011, 2011 at yeah. my kitchen table. Yeah. And we were like, let's do it. We're going to do this thing. Yeah. And that's how Trinity Financial Coaching started. And we just, and we've been moving and going ever since. Just again, coaching people and helping individuals um, tap into who they are so that they can walk their unique path for financial fulfillment. So they're building wealth. Willa. Yeah. <laughs> when Go you ahead. started the class with Wes, what were you doing at that time? When you when you were taking classes from her, what were you doing at that time? My husband and I took that class. And at that time, I was working in municipal government. So I was an administrator. And I would meet these people. I was working in housing first. And I would meet so many people who, they were struggling with money. And it was in public housing is where I was working. And so they would, in our state where I was, which was in Michigan, there was a governor who was elected and he eliminated general assistance. That was the name of that program. And that was where 18 year olds could get their own welfare check, have their own, um, have their own house paid, rent things paid for. And so many were cut off. And so they were not going to have it anymore. And they were talking about, well, where am I going to live and and what am I going to do? And I was trying to really understand how do I help them understand how you can move beyond working, well, move beyond depending on this program and any other program like this. And knowing that, knowing the needs of those mostly young women And knowing what my husband and I were trying to build, because at that time, I think we had been married about 15 years or something like that. And we were working, both of us individually, but we also had our own business. And so you're working and you're trying to build. And I'm like, I still need to know more about finance. And so you go to a church and we were new to this church. And I found out that this young lady was having this class. No, I got to be in that. So the both of us joined it. And I did. She's right. The goal that I had in my notebook was that in five or 10 years, I would be working or I would have a financial education company so that I could help those women that I had in the back of my head and help myself. And also recognizing that I didn't have anybody, nor did she, when we were younger, teaching us how to take that dime and break it into 39 pieces and spend it five and six (laughs) cents. We didn't know what to do. No one was teaching us that. Our parents taught us what they knew, but they didn't always have all of the education financially to show us how to not only earn money, but make it grow without grinding. And so we wanted to be able to do that. And when we came together, it was so exciting. We, that day in her kitchen, we literally cl- we cried because right. it was like, oh my god, oh my god, and that was only ordained by the Lord, and we know that because I didn't know her prior to that. I, I this was just my teacher, and now I closed that book, and we have been in the same church for ten years, never going back to look at that. But in this one meeting, I brought that binder to that meeting and saw that I didn't even remember it myself until I saw it. I was like, Oh no, my goodness. Oh my goodness. And then I showed it to her. And so that's, that's, that's where we are. So Wesley uh, (laughs) and Willa became, we were the financial czars in our church, but we realized (laughs) that there were that we, I mean, we were, there were so many people outside of our church who needed the education as well that, you know, we just had to pray and ask God to give us a direction to go to get it not only in the church, but also make that knowledge available outside of the church. And we're just still working at it, still working at it because he has not told us to stop. We're still moving forward with the one-on-one coaching, our group coaching program, with our podcast what, whatever it is that we need to do to do that. We believe the scripture that you talked about, Matthew 6 and 33, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. 
So that's how the, the creatives, the actors, all of them seek that first, not mammon, not the money, but seek him and he will direct you and add all those things that you really want. The money, the things, the opportunities, the blessings, they will all come. But prioritizing him is what we really need to do. And I'm just so grateful that uh, Wes and I got together and we're just continuing to grow and continuing to serve. And that's what we see this as, really a service. So we talked about crisis, financial crisis. We talked about trauma. We talked about struggling. And we talked about starting to heal and align ourselves with God. How do we start to grow our wealth? There are many paths. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I think fundamentally, you need to begin to understand that your money has to work harder than just your savings. Um, because your f money has to keep up with the rate of inflation. So you want to start looking at different ways that you can get your money to earn an interest rate that's over inflation. So over 2%. So you want to start looking at various ways that you are able to invest. One of the best ways to do that is um, through your retirement plan. So now if you are creative that has a full-time job with benefits, you want to start investing in their 401k plan, 403b, whatever retirement plan that they have. So yes, you want to do that. You want to start looking at different ways that your money can start growing um, in a tax efficient way as well as so that it's earning a rate of interest over inf the cost of inflation, which is at least 2%. So that's when you want to start. And if you're an start. entrepreneur, then how would you, would that be the same thing you do a retirement fund if you're an entrepreneur or where would you start to position your money little, you know, maybe a hundred dollars a month, where would you start positioning that to start growing your wealth? Well, you can always, uh, if you're in the, uh, have the ability to set aside money, if, if you can do a hundred dollars a month, set it aside uh, to begin investing in opportunities to help you in retirement, but you cannot do that until you are able to fully manage your monthly expenses and budget. So it's going to be very difficult if you don't have guaranteed income coming in, it's hard to set aside a large amount. Uh, a CFP would be able to help you in investing. We are there to be able to help you get prepared to go before a CFP and to make sure you are prepared to know what they're saying when you talk to them. What does we CFP? are able to do that. Uh, a certified financial planner or in a CPA, both of those. We, we want to make sure that you sit down in front of someone and when they start talking about investment products like, I don't know, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, you know what they are. And you know a little bit about the interest rate. You know what the expenses are. You know what kind of questions to ask them. We have to, you come to us, we help you understand those things so that when you go to them, you can do that. Because of our accreditation, we are not able to sell products, but we are definitely able and definitely willing to work with our clients to make sure that when they do go to those who will be selling products to them, that they are sure what they're buying, they know what to ask, and they know that the persons that they are standing before are credible and can do something to help them. But as Wes saying, taking advantage of the opportunities that you have in your full-time job, if you have those, that helps you to begin to position yourself for insurance. And another thing I think that's very important too, as you begin to build your assets, make sure that you protect them. Risk assessment is critical. I think insurance is one of the things that a lot of people will kind of push off a lot. They push off insurance on their vehicles, insurance on their homes, flood insurance. Right now, we are sitting in the midst of what just was a hurricane. It just passed over us, flooding all over the place. And for those who were not positioned with flood insurance or having the proper amount of homeowner's insurance, 
that could be devastating for whatever amount of money that you save. So protecting your assets is critically important. You may not have a lot, but what you have, you want to do the best you can to protect those. Little small and if you have a part-time time. job, you, you talked about if you have a full-time job as a creative, but what if you have a part-time job as a creative? What can you do in, in that case? Well, it, it really depends individually on what the needs of that person is and what their goals are and what they plan to do. You want to make sure if you have a part-time job, at least, I think that they should at least be able to try to put something aside. And if that part-time job is to, is it a part-time job along with your full-time acting gig? Is that what it is? Or is it a part-time job between acting gigs? Because if it is a part-time job where this is your sole income coming in, you're going to have to use those monies very wisely so that you can make it last between that. You may not be able to set anything aside because it's expensive to live. And so what you're earning on your part-time job may be just what you need or just what can sustain you until you get to that next job. If it is a part-time job while you are working on a project, set that money aside. Let that be what you're putting aside so that you can have that at the ready when you need it between the next time that you are out of a full-time job. Those are the things that you can do in order to help you if you have part-time. And I would say don't have so many part-time jobs that you forget that you do have to have rest time and to live. Because if you do that, then you won't stay there. You won't continue. You'll get tired and you'll just kind of roll back and not even be in, not even want to work at all. How can I find you on the podcast sites? We're um, on all on social media, on Instagram and Facebook at Wealth Wisdom Together. And then our website is www.mytfcoach.com. I'm so happy we got to do this. This was fantastic. <laughs> was this was so awesome. Thank you. And let me tell you something. You two just have such a power to you. Uh, it. I, I've been looking forward to this for months. I'm so excited. We got to. <laughs> we, are. we got to do part one because I know we're gonna do <laughs> some more because you two ladies have so much wisdom and so Thank much. You. you bring so much value to the table. The first time I heard you, I was like, "Oh my God! I need these women <laughs> to talk to the actors." So I just want to say thank you, Willa Williams, thank you. and thank you, Wesley. <laughs> Thank you both. You are amazing women of God oh, and you, you are bringing the word and financial literacy to so many people. And I am just honored that I get some of that too. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Thank you Thank so you. much for having us. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave us a comment. It helps us a lot. And share this episode with your friends and get ready for this next episode.